All right, well, let me just begin by saying that uh, if you're expecting a Christmas sermon this morning, you're not going to get one. <laughs> I'm sorry. Because <laughs> uh, we've got 52 chapters of Jeremiah to preach through, and we've got 52 weeks over here. So if I miss a week, we're going to fall behind. I'm not going to get through the whole book, you know what I mean? So uh, I am planning on preaching a Christmas sermon on the Thursday, though, because we do have church here on Thursday, uh, on Christmas Eve. I know not everybody's going to be here, but uh, if you did want to hear a Christmas sermon, then that's the day to come, all right? So we're still here in Jeremiah, and uh, look at verse number 9 there, Jeremiah chapter 11, verse number 9. It says, And the Lord said unto me, A conspiracy is found among the men of Judah. The title for the sermon this morning is, A Conspiracy is Found. Now, you know, there are things that people talk about when it comes to, um, you know, conspiracies. And, uh, you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of beliefs and there's a lot of ideas of what people would often term as conspiracy theories in this world, right? And uh, I think a lot of you guys, or I, even myself, we've looked into a lot of these conspiracies. And look, here's the thing about the, the, the truth of God's Word. If you don't believe in conspiracies, you don't really believe the Bible. Because something's very clear here, you know, a conspiracy is found. Now, here's the thing about a conspiracy. You know, conspiracies are a secret, uh, a secret plans. That's what it means to, you know, to, uh, to, uh, conspiracies are to conspire. You know, people come uh, with secret agendas and secret plans uh, for whatever their wicked pleasures are, their wicked devices. And people do these things secretly to deceive and to cause people and churches and entire nations to turn against God or, or to, you know, uh, you know to, to make, you know, billions and millions of dollars. Those conspiracies truly exist. There are wicked people like this in this world. And, you know, there was a conspiracy in the land of Judah at this point in time. It says the conspiracy was found, okay? So it was a secret, and then, and then it was discovered what this secret was, okay? And uh, we're going to definitely look into this. But one thing I do want to make very clear, even though there's a lot of true conspiracy theories out there, okay? One thing I, I really warn you as your pastor, as someone that cares for you, for your mental state, is don't go down this rabbit hole and believe every conspiracy that's out there. Okay, because it, it uh, even if it's true, it can corrupt your mind. Okay, because there's a lot of wicked things in this world. You know, the Lord wants us to be focused on His Word. You know, His Word tells us already there are conspiracies. We don't need to go down this rabbit hole and learn about all the wicked agendas and all the satanic practices because it's just going to bring fears. It's just going to bring confusion. And you're not going to be, really be able to function and, and, and think very clearly in this world. You know, whatever, whatever, whatever wickedness is going on, whatever conspiracies are going on, you know, you don't need to know what those things all are to live in this world. You just need to know God's Word and just live according to God's principles and you'll be fine. You'll be fine. Okay? God gives us everything we need in His Word. And what's great about His Word, we know it's 100% true. The conspiracies that are out there, we don't know if they're true. Many are true, but there are a lot of lies. There are a lot of hypotheses. There are a lot of theories out there that are not necessarily true. And when you get addicted to those conspiracy theories, you're going to start absorbing and consuming a lot of lies that you've mixed up with the truth. Okay, so I'm just telling you as your pastor, be careful of going down that, that uh, rabbit hole. A lot of people that have gone down that rabbit hole regret doing that and just wish they didn't, you know, they just focus on what God says and just understand that, yeah, there are definitely conspiracies out there and just leave it at that and let God tell us in his word how we ought to behave in this world. Okay, so let's go there in verse number one. Let's start there. Jeremiah chapter 11, verse number one begins by saying, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, so... If you've been here for the Jeremiah series so far, you know that this would mean that God has now given Jeremiah a new prophecy, something new to preach, right? And so it's a, it's a brand new prophecy that he's preaching now. What does he say in verse number two? Hear ye the words of this covenant and speak unto the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So God's telling Jeremiah, can you remind uh, my people here in Judah about the covenant that I have between uh, me and them? So what we're going to learn here is that Jeremiah just repeats the same covenant that God gave to Moses. And he's telling Jeremiah, look, remind them, tell them again. And we'll cover this in the, the men's uh, class on, on Friday with the Bible study and, and Bible preaching. That sometimes things have to be repeated, you know, over and over again. And God telling Jeremiah, can you repeat the same things that Moses told this nation in the past? Verse number three, and say thou unto them, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Cursed be the man that obeyeth not the words of this covenant. So we learn something about the old covenant, something that's quite different. Or it's similar to the new covenant, 
But basically, if you were uh, an Israelite and you were under the Old Covenant in the Old Testament days, if you did not obey the Lord, if, if your nation uh, became disobedient to the covenants and to the laws of God, they would become cursed by God. Okay, And uh, we often think about the blessings of God. And look, God bless that nation richly. You know, if they were obeying God, you know, God will bless them on the land. They won't have problems with enemies that are surrounding them. They're going to be fruitful. They're going to be productive. They're going to ha have happy lives. But when they disobey, God will curse them. Verse number four, which I commanded your fathers in the day that I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, Obey my voice and do them according to all which I command you. So shall ye be my people and I will be your God. Now this is very clear here. God is saying, look, I will only be your God. You will only be my people so long as you obey my commandments. So long as you keep this covenant between you and I. And look, God did not force them to enter into that covenant. After God presented the covenant to, to the people of Israel through Moses, the people of Israel said, yes, we agree. We want to be part of that covenant. They were obviously looking at the blessings and they were looking at God's miracles and they thought, yes, we're going to be able to keep this covenant and serve God. But as the generations went by, you know, you can see that they, in fact, it, that same generation, you know, uh, because they didn't go into the promised land, remember they doubted, they didn't have faith in the Lord that he would be able to bring them into the promised land. Even that same generation that said, yes, Lord, I'm going to obey, found themselves in disobedience and then wandering into the wilderness for, four, uh, for 40 years. And so, brethren, you know, what does God want from us? As we look at this and we want to take the application from us, God wants us to obey His Word, right? His laws, His Word, He wants us to obey. But what do we learn? That we can become disobedient very, very easily. You know, I've seen many times when, uh, you know, you'd have churches and you have evangelists, powerful preachers come behind the pulpit, and then it's like, you know, that they'll preach some, you know, maybe they'll preach to the young people and they'll say, look, you know, commit your life to, to mission work. You know, come and give your life before the Lord, not for salvation, but, you know, to serve the Lord all the days of your life. And, and you'd see people come down before the altar, if you know what I'm talking about, and they'll start praying, you know, before the pulpit. And they're just, they're, they're maybe tears and they're committing their life to God and they're, they're promising, Lord, I'm just going to obey you. I'm going to do everything that you want me to do from this day forward. How many of those now are not even in church? How many of those people, you know, may have gone into Bible college and then quit Bible college or they went into that, that system wanting to serve God full time and they're not even doing anything for the Lord now? I mean, look, we have to be careful when we make vows and promises to God. In fact, Jesus says, don't make any vows because he knows our, he knows our nature that we can promise things to God and then just quickly back out of them. That's not a good place to be, though. That's not a good thing. You know, it's better instead of just, you know, getting emotional and just committing your whole life to God to serve Him for the rest of your days and, and just, oh Lord, I'm, you know, I'll get into full-time ministry for you. Instead of doing that, just be the type of Christian that takes one step at a time. One step at a time. One step at a time. Just commit that one step that you need to do for the Lord. Lord, okay, you've given me this commandment. I see this law. Yes, Lord, I'm going to walk in that way, in that way that you've got me, okay? Instead of just giving this grand old, you know, promise to God and just come and, and, and failing like the, the Old Testament saints did, okay? Just one step at a time. That's the, God, that's, the, that's the secret of the Christian life. The successful Christian life is not go full on out there 100%, just, just one thing at a time. As the Lord shows you, as you're able to mature and grow in the Lord. And, and listen, if you just take one step at a time, you're going to be miles ahead of many Christians that committed their entire lives to serve God. Okay? Now, if you can keep your finger there, and let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy, please. The book of Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse number 1 because I want to take you back to this time when God made these promises, or sorry, uh, uh, sorry, um, uh, how He promised that He would bless them on the on on the on the land if they obeyed, and how God will curse them. And I just want to show you some amazing truths here. But in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter twenty-eight, verse number one, it says, "And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, and observe and to do all His commandments." which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, and thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. So if they just listen and obey God's words, God says, I'm going to bless you. You're going to be blessed above all the nations of the earth. Okay? Now, we're not going to read the whole chapter, but from... 
from, from uh, verse number 3 all the way to verse number 14. So let's just say all 14 verses there. Uh, God explained how he's going to bless them on, on the land. You can read that in your own time. Okay, but God's promised them so many wonderful things that if they just obey God, God will bless them. Okay, but now drop down to verse number 15. And now God explains what's going to happen to them if they disobey the Lord. In verse number 15, it says, But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. And so God now starts to list all the cursings that will fall upon them. And they're horrible. They're horrible cursings. Again, read this in your own time if you want. But I want to show you that basically from verse number 15 all the way to the end of the chapter, verse number 68, God lists all the curses that he would bring upon those people. So when you take that entire chapter in view, you've basically got 14 verses on blessings and 54 verses on the cursings. I mean, the cursings as far, you know, clearly outweigh you know, what the blessings are. And what I mean by that is this. Many times, in order for us to walk in, in God's right paths, you know, it, it's one thing for God to say, well, you know, if you walk in my ways, you'll be blessed. And there's a lot of preaching like that. You know, a lot of preaching like that. You know, just, just obey God and, and God will bless you and, and do good unto you. And that's the kind of sermons that we like. But you'll find that when that's the kind of preaching that you hear all the time, you will fall away from the Lord. And so many times, you also need to hear about the cursings of the Lord, okay? In fact, many more times than the blessings, because when you hear about how, how things can fall apart for you, how, you know, how you can go through trials and difficulties if you don't obey God's Word, that's going to keep you from going that way the first place, right? Usually, it's, it's the negative things that, that, that cause you to stay away from going into that life. And so, you know, there are churches that, that may not even preach against sin. They may not even say the word hell. You know, they don't warn people of God's judgment and God's cursings. And so for them, it's like, well, you know what? I can be blessed by God if I do what's right. But what's going to happen to me if I, do, if I don't obey God? Nothing. They're not familiar with that side of God. And God makes it very clear that He's a God that curses. And if you just understand that, that's going to help you stay away from, a, from an unbiblical, unlawful, wicked path. You know, understanding how God can curse and how God can allow he, even His own people to struggle in life. I just wanted to show that because that's, we're going to build on that. So let's go back to Jeremiah chapter 11, verse number 5. Jer Jeremiah chapter 11, verse number 5. <clears throat> now, now, Many times, you know, as we're looking for Jeremiah, it, it can be difficult to absorb. Even I find it difficult. I, I, even Jeremiah finds it difficult to, to understand and absorb God's coming judgment uh, to those of Judah. Okay? But I want you to see how Jeremiah responds to what God is saying here in verse number 5. God says that I may perform the oath which I have sworn unto your fathers to give them a land flown with milk and honey as it is this day. Then answered I, so now Jeremiah is answering God and said, So be it, O Lord. So be it, O Lord. And so, you know, one thing you need to understand, when, when things seem a little bit too heavy, have you ever like, spoken to somebody about the Bible and they say, Well, I like the God of the New Testament. You know, I, I like Jesus in the New Testament because it's full of love and mercy. But I don't like the God of the Old Testament, <laughs> they'll often say, right? But Jesus is the God of the Old Testament. It's the same God. You know, Jesus Christ is the Word of God. And the Bible is the Word of God, right? These are God's words. These are the words of Jesus Christ. But I just want you to notice that, you know, when it's difficult to stomach God's Word, you know, as long as we know it's coming from His Word, we ought to be like Jeremiah and say, well, so be it, O Lord. So be it, O Lord. You know, Jeremiah says, well, God, you actually wanted to bless us. You wanted us to be a, a great nation. You wanted us to be a light in, in this world and, and, and give the gospel to the Gentiles, Lord. But I can now see how far we've fallen from the covenant that we agreed into. And now Jeremiah is just realizing, wow, even though this judgment's hard to swallow, he, he realizes by, by knowing God's word that it is just, that it is righteous, that these curses and this judgment will fall upon the nation. And so he says, so be it, O Lord. You know, it's kind of like what we say when you hear good preaching and you agree with some truth. We we'll often say, hey, amen, so be it, you know, Lord. If that's the truth of your word, you know, the more we know God's word, we understand that God's judgments and God's cursings are actually right. 
You know, from God's perspective, even though it may seem very harsh from us. You know, and so that's something we need to learn. You know, just be able to say, so be it, Lord. You read something in the Bible, you know, it, 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 it embarrasses you because you know you're, you're not living the way God wants you to live. You just need to say, well, so be it, oh Lord. If that's your standard and I come short of that, Lord, I, I need to work on that, Lord. Can you help me? So be it, Lord. You know, we need to take that attitude instead of saying, well, Lord, I, I don't want to hear that part of it. Just accept what God's word is. You know, just accepting that's going to help you be able to make the changes you need to live godly, to obey his laws. Verse number six. Then the Lord said unto me, Proclaim all these words in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, saying, Hear the words of this covenant and do them. All right, I want us to turn to another passage now. Let's uh, keep our fingers there. Let's go to uh, Galatians chapter three. Galatians chapter three. And Matthias, can you just get me a, a cup of water or a bottle or something? All right, Galatians chapter 3, please. And uh, so we've seen in the Old Testament, okay, how God's people, if they disobeyed, they'd be cursed. If they obeyed, they would be blessed. Well, things are similar in the New Testament, but a little bit different as well. So that's something I want to show you here. Galatians chapter 3 and verse number 8. Galatians chapter 3 and verse number 8. It says, And the scripture for seeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham. Hey, did Abraham know the gospel? Yeah, yeah right there. It was preached to Abraham. You know, some people say, well, the Old Testament saints, they didn't know about the sacrifice of Christ. Absolutely they did. That is the gospel. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So Abraham knew about it, okay? Sometimes we, we don't give credit to the Old Testament saints of how much they knew, you know? But you see that the gospel was preached unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. And I haven't got time to cover this right now, but the, the blessing that will come upon the nations is the, the, uh, the sacrifice of Christ. That there are people across all nations in this earth that are saved and blessed today because of Christ, because of the gospel message. But verse number 9, So then they which, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. So how are we blessed in the New Testament now that Christ has come? You know, is it through obedience? Well, yes, to an extent, okay? But even more so, not your own personal obedience, not your own personal righteousness, your faith, the same faith that was from Abraham, that will bless you. Let's keep going, verse number 10. For as many as are the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written... Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Now, before I keep reading, I just want to bring back to, uh, to remembrance something that I've preached before. That, you know, in our Christian life, we have, kind of have two states. You know, we have our position before God. Okay? Uh, once you're saved, you are, you, you know, you are robed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You know, no matter how wicked you are, no matter how sinful you are, this is your position before God. When He looks down at you, He sees perfect righteousness because it's the righteousness of Christ received through faith. So that's one part of us. That's the new man, okay? But then we have the flesh, don't we? We have this flesh. This is the, the, the daily life that we live, and it's, sometimes it's good. You know, you're in church this morning. Hey, that's a good start to the week. It's the best way to start the week, being in the house of God. It's a great way, right? Because, uh, you know, the flesh doesn't want to be in church. But the, the new man wants to be in the church. But then, you know, as we go through the week, the, the flesh has its lusts and has its weakness and its sins that it, it travels after. And so while positionally we're always right with God 100%, our walk is not always right with God. Okay? And so positionally, we are blessed. We receive the blessings of Abraham because we're saved. Okay? And we saw how in the Old Testament they were blessed if they obeyed. Now listen, I know you never obey 100% of the time. But here's the good thing. Jesus obeyed 100% of the time. And if you're in Jesus Christ, God sees you in that perfect obedience. That's the new man. Okay? So that's what it's referring to here. That we're blessed in that sense. But then it talks about those that are trying to get saved by their own righteousness. By following the law. And God is saying, listen, if you want to be saved by the law, you have to keep every point of the law. Otherwise, you're cursed. And brethren, so we do have this idea here in our, in our New Testament days, uh, as well as the Old Testament, that, you know, if in order for you to be blessed by God, you must be saved. And those that are not saved, the unbelievers, they are under the curse of God. That will ultimately be fulfilled in the lake of fire. Okay? Ultimately, they will go to hell if they do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and they will suffer for all eternity the cursings of God. 
But let me just say, we've already escaped the curses of God because we're blessed with faithful Abraham. Okay, uh, let's keep going there in verse number 11. But, uh, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not a faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Now look at verse number 13. Christ have redeemed us from the curse of the law. Man, we cannot be cursed by God anymore. He's redeemed us from the curse of the law. Do you see that? It says here, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So, brethren, let me just say to you, you cannot be cursed by God because Jesus Christ became the curse for us. You know, all, the, all our disobedience, all our sins has already been nailed to the cross of Jesus Christ. He, he took on our curse. You know, not only do we receive the blessings because of His obedience, Jesus Christ received our curse because of our disobedience. What an amazing swap. That we had with, with the Lord God, right? So we cannot be cursed by God, you know, in the New Testament days because we're not part of this uh, old covenant. In fact, the better covenant is even better. Now, some people misunderstand and say, well, hold on. Don't you, don't you believe that we can be chastised by God? Absolutely. But don't forget, we're talking here about our position, okay, which cannot be cursed because we're perfect. The new man is always perfect. But then we have our walk. We have our walk with the Lord. But here's what's great about our walk in the Lord. You know, even when we disobey, we're still children of God. God does not curse us. He blesses us with chastisement. Chastisement is supposed to be a blessing, right? I mean, you know, uh, children that are, that are not disciplined, children that are not chastised, right? They're going to grow up to be spoiled kids, right? They're going to grow up to be rebellious, spoiled kids. It's a blessing to be chastised. All right, And so, you know, yes, we get corrected. I'm not saying we don't get corrected in our walk because we're far from the Lord. But, you know, what's wonderful about the New Testament days, we're not going to be cursed because Christ became the curse for us. Okay, That's one of the key differences between the Old Testament and the New Testament. We are under a better covenant. You know, the covenant that we have with the Lord God is a spiritual covenant, not a physical one. Okay, And so their blessings and cursings were based on their, 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 their walk, their physical relationship there or, or uh, fellowship with God, but our blessings and curses fall upon the spiritual element which comes from the new man, you know, with the Lord uh, God. And, and of course, that is because of Jesus Christ. Let's keep going there, verse number 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Okay, so let me just summarize very quickly. Does God still curse today? Absolutely. Okay, but it's dependent on whether you have believed or rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're being blessed with faithful Abraham. You're keeping the, com the commandments 100%, not because of you, but because of Christ. Okay, but those that are trying to get saved by their own works, by some false religion, by some false gospel, they are still under God's curse. And it's our job to bring them out of that curse, right? And say, look, Christ became the curse for you. Come and enter into the blessings through Jesus Christ's righteousness. Okay? Back to uh, Jeremiah chapter 11, verse number 7. Jeremiah chapter 11, verse number 7. God says, For I earnestly pro protested unto your fathers in the day that I brought them up out of the land of Egypt, even unto this day, rising early and protesting, saying, Obey my voice. God is saying, look, time and time again, I've been sending you prophets. I've been protesting. Hey, wake up. Come and obey the, the laws of God. You know, when God's judgment falls like this, it's been a long time coming. You know, we can't turn around and say, well, God, why are you allowing this stuff, you know, things to happen? It's been a long time coming, you know, for them. They've, this nation has been in disobedience to God time and time again. God's given them chance after chance after chance. You know, Jeremiah is just one prophet of a long line of preachers that have come through trying to get that nation back on track. Verse number eight. Yet they obeyed not, nor inclined their ear, but walked every one in the imagination of their evil heart. Therefore, I will bring upon them all the words of this covenant, which I commanded them to do, but they did them not. So he says, look, I'm going to bring all the words, right? What are the words? Of the cursings, right? Because you've not been in obedience. Verse number 9. And the Lord said unto me, A conspiracy is found among the men of Judah, and among the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So God is saying, there are people in Jerusalem 
that have had uh, a secret plan. They've been conspiring. They've created a conspiracy. You say, what is that about? Well, look at verse number 10. They are turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers, which refused to hear my words, and they went after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant, which I made with their fathers. What do we learn there? We learn that this whole idea of turning against the Lord and worshipping idols wasn't some organic process. It wasn't some natural process where somehow God's let them down and they're like, well, where is God? Well, maybe we need to find God somewhere else. No, the reason the nation went this way is because there was a conspiracy. There were people on that land that purposely, secretly planned, hey, we don't like God. You know, these would be reprobates. These would be people that hate God. And they're like, you know what? I, we don't like that our nation uh, is serving God and sacrificing to God. We need to come up with a plan to turn our entire nation away from the God of Israel onto these false gods. So it wasn't some organic thing. There was a conspiracy. There was a secret plan by wicked people turning you know, the nation's heart against the Lord. And brethren, why, does Austra- why, why in Australia, why is it that our laws that are being passed why are they constantly against God's word? Why are they undoing the things where, where our laws used to be in line with God's laws? Why, why are they turning against that, brethren? Is it just naturally, uh, we just need to, you know, we just need to change things up? i tell you why things are changing. Because there's a conspiracy in our land. There are wicked people in Australia that are purposely trying to take our nation away from the God of Israel and to worship false gods or to just to hate God. All right, just to be in disobedience to God, these things happen because there are wicked people conspiring. Okay? Say, man, I've got to go on YouTube and find out what all these conspiracies are. Don't bother. God just tells us in His Word, this is what happens. That ought to be good enough for us. Okay? There are wicked people doing these things. Okay? And just be aware. Be aware that the reason nations turn against God is because wicked people are in this nation purposely trying to cause us to turn against the Lord. Yes, the media is involved. You know, yes, powers and and lobby groups are involved. And yes, you know, these things are going on. Yes, many religious leaders in many churches are involved in this conspiracy to turn our nation against God. You know, there are are people in power that are doing this. And you say, well, Kevin, you sound like a conspiracy nut. I just believe the Bible. Okay, if this happened in in the land of Judah, where where they were more godly, supposedly, they had the right God. Okay, I mean, Australia's never been really a Christian nation. At least these guys were truly a nation that had covenant with God. If this happened there, it's definitely happening here. It's definitely happening to the nations that were once considered a nation that that was Christian. You know, they've just had wicked people come in, create plans, and they've deceived the nation to turn against the Lord. But brethren, knowing this, knowing this, that our nation is purposely turning against the Lord, that doesn't mean we need to go down the same way. Okay, that just means, well, hey, that's the situation. We're going to stand steadfast. We're going to stand with the Lord. We're going to continue serving the Lord no matter what happens. Amen. Can you please turn to Acts chapter 20? Acts chapter 20. Again, keep your finger there in Jeremiah. Acts chapter 20 and verse number 28. You know, uh, many years ago when I started to understand this idea and uh, understand that people are so wicked that really hate God and actually want others to hate God as well, it was hard for me to understand. In, in, in fact, it's still difficult for me to understand. You're, you're turning to Acts chapter 20, Acts chapter 20. It's still a little bit difficult to understand, right? Because I don't know why, I, I just, I, I guess, especially as a pastor, you kind of have to think best of people, right? And, and you know, the Bible warns us time and time again that there are going to be people that creep into churches to conspire, you know, people that are, that are actually wicked, that will, you know, find pleasure in spending an hour, two hours at church for the purpose to cause, cause division, for the purpose to turn the church against the Lord and, and just to destroy that institution of the church. And we need to be aware of this because, you know, I, I can't really understand why people would do it. And so I can fall into the trap of thinking, well, I don't understand why people would do it. Therefore, it doesn't happen. No, it happens. It definitely happens. Okay. Acts chapter 20, verse number 28. Acts chapter 20, verse number 28. We have Paul here speaking to uh, our pastors. He says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the, the which the Holy Ghost have made you overseers 
to feed the church of God, which he have purchased with his own blood. But look at what he says in verse number 29. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. You know, there are wolves that come into God's church to hurt the flock of God. I mean, why? I mean, if I wanted to cause damage, the last thing I would be thinking about is going to church and destroying people that just love God. But people can be so wicked when they just come into church. They look like a sheep. They look like a brother in the Lord. We might even call them brother and sister for a while, only for eventually those ears of the wolves to pop out. And you know that they've come into church to conspire, to cause problems, to hurt God's people. Look at verse number 30. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember, and by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone, night and day with tears. Listen, Paul was preaching every single day, for three years, day and night, preaching, 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 warning people against false prophets, warning people against the wolves that will enter God's house. We need to be aware of this, brethren. I know we're a small church, but it can happen. We, 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 we don't know. There might be someone today. It's possible. What did it say? Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Okay? And so... Listen, there can be conspiracies even in the house of God. You know, if, if someone takes your side and wants to whisper in your ear, right, and, and, and cause you to, you know, feel, uh, I don't know, unhappy in the church, you know, trying to find every little problem, instead of, being, instead of uh, looking at the blessings of God, they just want to sort out, you know, find every little issue, every little problem, start whining and complaining in your ear, you know, start, start saying rumors and, and, and gossiping about people in the church or gossiping about the pastor. Brethren, be alert. Be aware. Okay, don't be part of that conspiracy. Okay, don't be part of it. Okay, because there, are, there can be people like that that just come into church for the purpose of destroying the church. Just like they're in Judah. People in that land purposely conspiring secret plans to destroy the nation. Okay, let's go back to Jeremiah chapter 11, verse number 11. Jeremiah chapter 11, verse number 11. God says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon them, which they shall not be able to escape. And though they shall cry unto me, I will not hearken unto them. So we've seen this topic before that, you know, even in turmoil, people that worship false religions, worship false gods, when things get hard for them, they're still going to call out to God. They're still going to pray out to God and ask Him for help. But God says, hey, if you're that wicked and you're turning the people's hearts against me, I'm not even going to listen to you. Okay? God can get to a point where He will not listen to the prayers of people that hate Him. Verse number 12. Then shall the cities of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem go and cry unto the gods unto whom they offer incense, but they shall not save them at all in the time of their trouble. Hey, so we've covered that, we've seen this many times already, that they go to their false gods, ask the false gods for help. They're not going to help. They're dead gods, right? That they can't answer prayers. Verse number 13. For according to the number of thy cities were thy gods, O Judah, and according to the number of the streets of Jerusalem have they set up altars to that shameful thing, even altars to burn incense unto Baal. So God's saying here, look, all the cities... You know, even all the streets had these idols, had these altars, had sacrifices. I mean, this whole place, this, Jerusalem had really become, you know, a, a, you know, if we walked into Jerusalem during that day, we would not see any uh, resemblance of, of a Christian nation, of Christian people. It would be like, it would just be like entering some pagan land, right? I, I guess it would be like walking into some of the cities in, in India, right, where, where Hinduism is the main uh, religion and just walking and seeing all these idols and statues and seeing all these crazy... You say, well, what? How is this the nation of God? Right? Things had become so bad. Look at verse number 14. And, and God says to Jeremiah, Therefore pray not thou for this people, neither lift up a cry or prayer for them, for I will not hear them in the time that they cry unto me for their trouble. I've covered this already, how God, you know, will sometimes, you know, ask His people, don't even pray for those that are exceedingly wicked. Now, brethren, I'm just going to read to you from Proverbs 28, verse number 9. You don't have to turn there, I'll just read it to you. Proverbs 28, and verse number 9. It says, 
He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. Now, brethren, I do not want your prayers to God to be abomination to him. Okay? So what do we have to do? When we hear God's laws, don't turn your ear away from them. Okay? Don't, it, listen, if, if you, uh, you know, know what God wants from you, and you're purposely disobeying the Lord, okay? you're purposely turning you away from the Lord, you're purposely walking away from the Lord, and you get to a point where you need to pray, God, I actually need your help, well, that prayer is going to be an abomination to God. What a strong word. An abomination to God. Okay? And so this is what you do. You know, if you're far from God, I've said it many times, you've got to confess your sins. You've got to humble yourself. You've got to be broken and go to God and help me. Please forgive me for my sins. Help me walk in your ways. Then go and ask of the Lord what you need. Okay? Get right with God. Settle things with the Lord. Right? Be close with the Lord. Then you can bring your prayers before Him. You know, make sure your prayers are not an abomination. Verse number 15. What have my beloved to do in mine house, seeing she have wrought lewdness with many, and the holy flesh is passed from thee? When thou doest evil, then thou rejoicest. Okay, so that is not the time to pray to the Lord. That is not the time to go and ask God for help. When you're rejoicing in evil, when you're enjoying the sin of this world, no, 1 John 1, 6 says, For if we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Okay? You cannot be in a place of darkness, rejoicing in weakness, rejoicing in sin, and think you can just pray to God like a genie and He'll just answer your prayers. It's not going to happen. You have to humble yourself. You have to go to God with a contrite heart, ask Him for forgiveness. Okay? Then bring your prayers and supplications before God. Okay? Let's make sure that our prayers are actually received by God and can be answered. All right? We have to do it in the right place. We have to do it through the new man, not while we're enjoying the, the lust and the sins that this flesh enjoys. Verse number 16. The Lord called thy name a green olive tree. So the Lord here is referring to the nation of Israel as this olive tree. Okay? Fair. So fair means beautiful and of goodly fruit. So it's producing good fruit. With the noise of a great tumult, he have kindled fire upon it, and the branches of it are broken. So, Israel was once this beautiful olive tree, very fruitful, but now it's been burnt up and branches are breaking off it, right? Verse number 17. For the Lord of hosts have planted thee, have pronounced, that, sorry, that planted thee, have pronounced evil against thee, for the evil of the house of Israel and of the house of Judah, which they have done against themselves to provoke me to anger in offering incense unto Baal. Now, let's understand this. Let's turn to John chapter 15, please. Let's go to John chapter 15. Because when you think about a tree and branches being broken off that tree, what reference do you kind of think about in the New Testament? Anyone want to give me an idea? Olivet Discourse. Olivet Discourse? Well, well yeah, because it's got a tree there, right? It's got a tree. No, I'm not thinking about that one. I'm thinking about branches being bro broken off. Does anyone know that reference in the New Testament? Olive, Sorry? Is that the olive tree in Romans? It's, it's in Romans. Yeah, I don't, know, I don't think it's referred to as a... Yeah, Romans 11. Yeah, Romans 11. But before we turn to Romans 11, let's turn to John 15. So let's understand this, okay? Because I don't want you to end up in this sermon thinking that you can lose your salvation, something like that, okay? You, obviously, you cannot lose your salvation, okay? But let's turn to John 15, verse 5, very quickly. John 15, verse 5. Because this same teaching is taught in the New Testament, where there is a tree and branches can be broken off. But in John 15, verse 5, Jesus says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. So we are branches, brethren. We are the branches of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. So God said, hey, the olive tree, yeah, you, had, you were very fruitful before. Right? So if we abide in Christ, we can bring forth much fruit. You know how you get many people saved? You abide in Christ. You're close to God. God can use you to be very fruitful and bring others into the kingdom of God. But look at verse number 17. Sorry, verse number 6. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Okay, so this is not teaching you can lose your salvation if you don't abide in Christ. It's saying, hey, this is part of our walk, not our position. Our position is perfect, right? But our walk, 
we can be far from God. I already covered this, where if you're so far from God, you can get to a point where the salt has lost its savor or where the tree can no longer bring forth fruit and you become a waste. You know, even as a Christian, you become a complete waste for God and you've lost your opportunity to do anything for God. And so as it is in this illustration, you're like a branch that, well, it's not producing the fruit anymore. Let's just cast it away. Let's just break it off the tree and just burn it in the fire. Okay? And let other branches grow on that tree that can be fruitful for God. Okay? So this is not teaching you can lose your salvation because positionally you're 100% with God, but our walk with God can get so far from Him where we are no longer any use to God. That's what John chapter 15 is speaking about. Okay? Again, speaking about believers. Now let's turn to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, verse number 16. It is so important. It is so basic, but it's, it is so important that you understand the difference between your position and your walk. Because you're going to read passages in the Bible, and if you don't understand what, it, what it's talking about, you're going to end up thinking you can lose your salvation or something like that. Okay? Because you can lose, uh, you, you can get far from God in a walk, Right? But you can never lose your position, okay? But Romans 11, verse 16. Romans 11, verse 16. Again, this is speaking about the Old Testament Israelites. It says, For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. So the, the first fruits or the root, speaking about Christ. And if Christ is holy, so are we holy, right? Because we're, we're in His righteousness. You know, we can be as holy as Christ is positionally. Before God, When God looks at us, He sees us in the holiness and the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But look at verse number 17. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree, wert graft in among them, and with them partakest of the roots and fatness of the olive tree. It says, Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the roots, but the roots thee. That will say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Okay, so what we're learning here in the New Testament, that we have this olive tree where we, it's a wild, we're like this wild olive tree. You know, the, the nation of Israel is, is kind of like this, this olive tree that God planted. You know, it, it's, it's planted by a gardener. And then God compares the Gentiles, you know, because we were, we were not a people of God. Yeah, we're an olive tree as well, but this, we're this wild olive tree that just kind of just grew out of the wilderness, right? Nobody really planted it. It just, it just grew out of the wilderness, right? And so that's kind of like us. And it's saying that some of those branches of the, of the tree uh, were broken off so we can be grafted into that tree, okay? And we say, why were they broken off? Well, look at this in verse number 20. It says, well, so well, yeah, you're right. You know, you are right that those branches were broken off so you would be grafted in, right? Uh, well, because of unbelief, they were broken off, that thou, that thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. So brethren, this is what God is saying. He's saying, look, God did not spare the natural branches. You know what? If they were not believing in Christ, if they were not, you know, because how, how do we get saved? By believing, right? Well, those people, those branches, the, the Old Testament, not, I wouldn't say saints because they were not saved, but the Old Testament Israelites that were broken off, they were broken off that nation, the nation of Israel, because they had unbelief. They did not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But then you can take wild branches like us, Gentiles, that do believe in Jesus Christ and we're added to that tree. Okay? And we're with Christ. We abide with Christ. And so, yeah, Romans chapter 11 is basically uh, explaining what Jeremiah was teaching in Jeremiah chapter 11. Because many of those people were being broken off as branches. They were still part of the nation physically, but they were, being, they were broken off because they were dying as unsaved people. They were worshipping false gods. They were not believers of God. They were not believers of Jesus Christ. So they were being broken off that tree. You know? Hey, what's wonderful about us, we can be brought into that tree. Okay? And some people see, this is, again, this is the problem with dispensational theology. They'll say, well, the, the nation of Israel is this totally separate body, and we're some, you know, that's, the, that's Israel, and we're like the church. No. Okay? If, if we believe in Christ, we're part of one tree. Christ is the root of it all. Okay? And so, anyway, I want to show you this, because then it says in verse number 21, If God sped not the natural branches, take heed also... He also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. 
on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, uh, shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. So it says, look, yes, the, the Jews today, they're not part of that tree. They're not God's special people. They don't abide in Christ. They're not God's people at all. But if they don't abide in unbelief, in other words, if they believe, they will be brought back into that branch themselves. If they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, listen, sometimes when you preach this, you know, you're, you're accused of hating the Jews or something like that. How dare you say that about the Jews? It's like, no. It's just that they're the same as anybody else. You know, if, if they don't believe, they're not part of the tree. They're not part of that old tree. But if Jews, Gentiles, Australians, New Zealanders, you know, South Americans, Europeans, wherever you're from, brethren, if you believe, you're grafted into that tree. But did you notice that it said there that, uh, you know, um, in verse number 22, sorry, verse, let's read verse number 21 and verse number 22 again. If God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. He's saying, look, just like he didn't spare them, he might not do it to you. All right? Verse number 22. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God, of them which fell severity, but toward the goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. And so we say, well, hold on. Does that mean we can be broken off that tree and lose our salvation? Well, no. Don't, don't forget, what is it that gets us saved? Our faith, our belief. So positionally, okay, we're always saved. Okay, but again, if we don't, uh, what was it? Um, if thou continue in his goodness. So if we continue in his goodness, we're always going to be in the presence of God. We're always going to receive his blessings. But if we don't follow his laws, if we don't listen to his word, in our walk, we can get far from God. And as it were, as we read there in John 15, we can be like that branch that is broken off and is only worth being uh, burnt up. Okay, but that's our walk. That's our walk. Okay, that's not our salvation. And so you need to understand these two ideas of the Christian faith, right? Your position, which never changes, and your walk, which you can get really far from God, where you can become completely useless, you know, salt that has lost its savor, okay? This is not teaching that you can lose your salvation. And so what we learn here, when we go back to Jeremiah chapter 11, is the reason these branches were being broken off, okay, was because, yes, because of their wickedness, but many of these were not even saved, Okay, they're not even saved. Yeah, they're part of the physical nation, but if they died anyway, they would still go to hell. Okay? Yes, they were God's people in, in that sense because they were in that old covenant, but again, if they were not saved, if they were not believers of Jesus Christ, they would be broken off and, and sent to hell. Okay? Anyway, let's go back there. Jeremiah 11, verse 18. And the Lord hath given me knowledge of it, and I know it. Then thou sh uh, sh uh, showedest me their doings. So Jeremiah is saying, God has given me the knowledge of the conspiracy. Now, now I know it. Okay? So Jeremiah did not go to YouTube okay, to learn about the conspiracies of the land. Okay? He said, no, God told me about the conspiracy. Okay? Through his word. So you want to learn about conspiracies, brethren? You go to God's word. You learn about what's going on. And then he won't surprise you so much what's going on in this world. Okay? Because it's already, it's already played out for us in the Bible. Okay, God's, you know, God knows how much we can absorb, how much we can take, how much is going to help us live a clean and pure life. So he gives us what we need in his word. We don't need to defile our minds with what's going on in the conspiracy land on YouTube. God gives us the knowledge. Okay, and, and what was the knowledge? The conspiracy of the nation turning against the Lord, but also a conspiracy to kill Jeremiah. A conspiracy to persecute God's saved people. Verse number 19 says, But I was like a lamb or an ox that is brought to the slaughter, and I knew not that they had devised devices against me. Okay, so Jeremiah says, I didn't know these people were trying to kill me, but now God's revealed it to me, this conspiracy, that there are people trying to persecute God's people. So brethren, let me tell you now, there are people in Australia, I don't want to surprise you, but just listen to God's word, there are people in, in, in this land that hate God so much that actually want to persecute Blessed Hope Baptist Church. They actually want to persecute each one of us, our families, and hurt us and destroy our lives. There are people like this in this world. Okay? You say, how do you know? Because God just told us. Okay? God's told Jeremiah, well, it's the same for us. It's the same for God's people. As we see our nation get into further wickedness, understand that there are people in this land that want to hurt God's people. There's a conspiracy against us. There's a conspiracy against every church that names Christ, that is a true believer of Christ, 
there is a conspiracy. Okay? And if that worries you, well, don't worry. We've got God. He's greater than all these things. God, God knows. It's not a secret. To, you think it's a secret to God? In fact, God laughs about it. Okay, you read, read Psalm chapter 2 when you have time. God laughing at the conspiracy theories. He thinks it's a joke. He's mocking at them. Okay, so if God's able to laugh, I'm going to laugh with God. Okay, we've got God as our defense. All right. And then it says there, uh, so I knew not that they had devised devices against me, saying, let us destroy the tree with the fruit thereof, and let us cast, cu sorry, cut him off from the land of the living, that his name may be no more remembered. So what's Jeremiah? Here's a tree that produces fruit. What did God say about the nation? They were a tree that had lost, produce, not, not producing its fruit anymore. Okay? So brethren, look, Australia might be considered by God, you know, like a tree that's not fruitful. Okay? But hey, that doesn't have to stop us from not being fruitful. We can still be soul winners. We can still, you know, uh, allow the, the fruits of the Spirit's work in our lives to be more Christ-like and, and be a witness unto God. We don't need to worry about how wicked this world gets. We can still be fruitful for God. Okay? Now, what I love about verse number 19 is their goal was to cause Jeremiah's name, look at the end of verse number 19, that his name be, uh, may be no more remembered. They wanted nobody to remember Jeremiah's name. Well, some 2,600 years later, we're still talking about Jeremiah. <laughs> okay? So God can do amazing things. Who cares about the conspiracies that are against us? You know, I mean, their names aren't even mentioned. We don't even know who they are. Their names have been forgotten, but Jeremiah's name, in fact, not only is it going to be remembered today and tomorrow and next week when people preach about Jeremiah and 10 years from now when people preach about Jeremiah, but for all eternity, his name, he's got a whole book named after him. You know, if, if God's book is eternal, well, Jeremiah's name is going to be eternal forever. It's going to be remembered for all eternity. So praise God for Jeremiah, right? Verse number 20. But O Lord of hosts, thou judgest righteously and triest the reins and the heart. Let me see thy vengeance on them, and unto thee have I revealed my cause. All right, so important that we turn to this passage. Keep your finger there. Let's go to Jer uh, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. So God's, I mean, Jeremiah says, well, Lord, yep, you revealed this conspiracy to me, the conspiracy for the nation, the conspiracy that people are trying to kill me. He says, well, let me see thy vengeance on them. Did Jeremiah say, you know what, Lord, now that I know that these people are trying to hurt me, I'm going to take vengeance. You know what? I'm going to do them evil because they're trying to do me evil. Was that Jeremiah's response? That says, God, you know what? You judge righteously. I'm going to leave it in your hands, Lord. And I'm going to see your vengeance, thy vengeance on them. Hey, help, let me see this a little bit. Like, he kind of wanted to see how God will step in and take care of him. Okay? But this is important for us to remember. Because you know, when you fill your minds with conspiracy theories, you're going to think you have to do something. Right? I've got to do something to overcome this conspiracy in the land. Listen, God knows. Let him judge righteously. Leave it in God's hands. All right? And we ask God, can you have your own vengeance, Lord, upon that? Romans chapter 12, verse number 19. Romans chapter 12, verse number 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Amen. Vengeance is the Lord's. Pastor Kevin, do you truly believe there are people trying to hurt our church? Absolutely. Do you really believe there are people trying to hurt each of our families in this church? Absolutely. That gets me worried. Listen, God knows. Okay, ask God, Lord, you know what? I'm going to let you take care of it. Vengeance is yours, Lord. Okay, and I'm going to, I'm, look, instead of avenging myself, I'm going to give place unto wrath. God, I'm going to allow you to use your wrath right to avenge me lord i want you to step in who knows how many times but i don't know it's very possible that many attempts have already been made to hurt our church maybe many attempts have been made to hurt you and your families you don't even know because god's already stepped in and taken care of it you don't even know right who, who knows how many times people have tried to hurt us and god has taken care of it for us okay we won't know until we get to heaven Okay, but God lets us know here for Jeremiah, hey, there are conspiracies. Hey, Jeremiah did not know about it. Now he does. He says, well, Lord, vengeance is yours. I'm not going to do anything about it. I'm just going to continue doing what I'm doing, Lord, and I'm going to let you take care of those that are trying to hurt me. Verse number 21. Back in, sorry, Jeremiah 11, 21. Jeremiah 11, 21. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of the men of Anathoth, that seek thy life, saying, prophesy not in the name of the Lord, that thou die not by our hand. So what it's saying here is that the men that are conspiring against Jeremiah are from Anathoth. 
Okay, you say, what is Anathoth? Go back to Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse number 1. Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse number 1. It begins by saying, The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests. So Jeremiah was a son of a priest that were in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin. So Jeremiah was from Anathoth. Okay? So what it's saying here, there are people in his own, from his own town, from his own community, that actually want to hurt him. Okay? And that reminds me of the words of Jesus Christ. I'll just read it to you in Mark 6.4. It says, But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own king, uh, and among his own king, kin, and in his own house. So Jesus Christ says, that for whatever reason, this is the case. Where if you've got a preacher, you've got a prophet of God, people generally from other places want to hear him preach. But those from his own town, those that know him well, those that grew up with him, those that maybe of his own family will not honor him. Like will not give credence to what he's preaching. Okay, and this is part of the reason I didn't want to start a church in Sydney. Right? It's part, part, of, part of the reason I went to the Sunshine Coast because I wanted to be a prophet that, that that's honoured. You know that that what, what I'm not that, for me, but that what I'm preaching is effective. That people will listen and say, "Well, that's the word of God. I want to make those changes." Because if you don't honour the prophet, you're not going to even pay attention to what he's saying. Okay, and so anyway, praise God that we got a church here. <laughs> you know, it wasn't my original plan, but we're here. But you know, this is just a for some reason, you know, sometimes you'll find that you know, as, as a Christian, as someone that's trying to live godly, that the people that uh, grew up with you, those that know you best, will uh, try to discredit you. Okay, again, it can come from your own family, right? You're trying to be godly. Come on, man, I know you, what you got up to in your teenage years, right? You're, you're, you're preaching God's word, I know what you're like, that's not you know, and, and so you, you kind of lose that credibility. But even these people, they even try to uh, cause Jeremiah to be killed. You know, Jeremiah's just preaching God's word. I guess it offended them that much that they thought it'd be best to shut him, shut him up. But verse number 22, back in Jeremiah 11, verse 22. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will punish them. The young men shall die by the sword. Their sons and their daughters shall die by famine. And there shall be no remnant of them. For I will bring evil upon the men of Anathoth, even the year of their visitation. So God promises, Jeremiah, don't worry. Those that are conspiring, conspiring against you, those that are trying to kill you, I'll take care of them. I'll punish them. Not just them, but their, their entire families are going to be uh, a die. They're going to die during this time. And again, even the year of their visitation, again, that, that terminology means when I come and bring judgment upon them. It's going to happen. God promises that he's going to judge those that were trying to hurt Jeremiah. And brethren, I don't know if this gives you comfort or not. It should. But those that are trying to hurt you, okay, God will judge them. God will bring them low. God will destroy them. Okay? God's got the time, even the year of their visits. I don't know what year that is. But there's coming a time when God will judge our enemies, those that are trying to hurt us. Okay? We ought to love our enemies. We ought to do good unto our enemies. Okay? Not to take vengeance on them, but let God be the one that takes vengeance on them. Right? Let God be the one that is wrathful toward them. So, brethren, let me just conclude by saying, yes, there's a lot of conspiracies, okay? Our, 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 our nation will turn against the Lord more and more. People will strive to try to hurt our church. We will have wolves that will creep into our church from time to time that will try to destroy us, brethren. But don't forget, you don't need to be fearful. You don't need to worry, okay? Be walking with the Lord, be close to God, and ask God, well, Lord, this is the case. There are conspiracies. Lord, I'm not going to invest my, my mind in, these, in this junk, I'm not going to invest my time in these things that just uh, bring sorrow and fear and sadness. Lord, I just want to focus on you, focus on your word. Vengeance is yours, Lord. Please take care of my enemies. We leave it in God's hands. Amen? Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord.